thank you. Um, I'm talking about science and spirituality, and I'm interested in this partly because I'm a scientist and partly because I'm interested in spiritual practices. Um, I've written two books recently uh, about science and spiritual practices. The first is called Science and Spiritual Practices. <laughs> <laughs> the second one, perhaps more enigmatically, is called Ways to Go Beyond and Why They Work. And uh, there's really a part of the same project. Um, each book discusses seven different spiritual practices which have now been studied scientifically. Um, and I think this is the most exciting way in which science and spirituality are coming together at present. Because if you just have a purely theoretical argument, you'll have people who'll say spirituality is all complete nonsense, it's rubbish, it's superstition, on the grounds it's unscientific. And then there are people who did spiritual things, religious people and so on. But things are much more interesting now than they used to be. because. Um, we now have access to spiritual practices from the entire world's traditions. Um, when I was growing up, I'd never heard of yoga or meditation. And now there are millions of people doing yoga and meditation all over the world, far beyond their home in India. We have access to all these different spiritual traditions. And there's also a tremendous upsurge in interest in spirituality at the moment. Um, although organized religion is declining in Europe and to some extent in North America, um, the, the interest in spirituality is accelerating um, and it's a remarkable phenomenon of the modern secular world. Partly because there's so much interest in the secular context, there's now been a lot of scientific research. Literally thousands of papers have, in peer-reviewed journals have studied the effects of religious and spiritual practices on people's health and well-being. The results are unambiguous. Taking part in religious and spiritual practices, generally speaking, makes you happier, healthier, and live longer. The converse, presumably, is also true. Not taking part in them makes you unhappier, unhealthier, <laughs> and live shorter, which is why I think militant atheism should come with a health warning. Um, <laughs> because it often detaches people from their traditional religious practices and leaves them nothing in their place. Now, many atheists have now recognized exactly this fact. And um, the new generation of atheists, people like Sam Harris, um, are now into spiritual practices. Sam Harris, who's one of the so-called new atheists, is now giving online meditation courses. Um, Alain de Botton, who's one of our leading atheist philosophers in Britain, uh, wrote a book called Religion for Atheists. And um, he trying to recover the benefits of religion for people who've left their ancestral religion or that of their parents or grandparents. Um, uh, because he thinks it's so important for people's health and well-being. So this is uh, the situation we're in. And um, I I'm going to talk, I don't have time to talk about all 14 practices I describe in my books. Um, but I'll start with just one of them, which uh, 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 gratitude, which is uh, the simplest to investigate scientifically. Um, positive psychologists are a school of psychology that's been going on since about 2000 as a kind of official part of academic psychology. And it's about what makes people happy, as opposed to more traditional forms of psychology, which are about what makes people miserable. And so positive psychology has looked at what kinds of situations are people most happy in. And one of the answers is that when they're in a state of flow, if they're, it can be dancing, singing, being absorbed in work, having a great conversation, being in a state of flow is very conducive to happiness. And many spiritual practices uh, produce states of flow. One of the things that positive psychologists did by looking at uh, people who are happy is to find out what kind of characteristics happy people had. And they found that happy people are very often grateful people. Um, uh, the critics then said, well, of course they're grateful. They're grateful because they're happy. Uh, so, <clears throat> so they tried to find out whether they were happy because they were grateful. And they did some simple experiments. Uh, one of them involves um, 
uh, taking a group of people like this who divide into three groups at random. One group is asked to write a list of hassles and problems they've had in the previous week. The other group just writes a story about something that happened. And the third group writes a list of things for which they feel grateful, good things that have happened, things for which they feel grateful. And the people who simply make a list of things they feel grateful for are measurably happier for days afterwards. The exercise that, was most, that had the biggest effect in their experiments was what they called the gratitude letter. They, uh, they asked people to think of someone who'd helped them in their life who they'd never properly thanked or acknowledged. It could be a family member, a teacher, a, a friend, um, and write them a letter thanking them. Uh, they then went to that person and read them the gratitude letter. People who did that were happier for two months afterwards as a result of this simple exercise. Now, all religions encourage gratitude. There are lots of hymns of praise and thanks in the Christian hymn books. It, all religions have uh, ways of expressing gratitude. And a very traditional way of doing it in many families throughout Europe and in other parts of the world is by giving thanks before meals, saying grace before meals. Um, in a secular society, that's exactly the kind of practice that drifts away. People just give it up or forget about it or pay no attention. So now in most households in Britain, before meals, in, at least in those households where people still sit down together to eat, um, there's often an awkward pause before the meal and someone says, oh, oh do start, it'll get cold, or, or something like that. A, a kind of gap where the grace ought to be. In traditional institutions like uh, Cambridge colleges, uh, there is a long Latin grace. My own college, Clare College, has a, a long grace before dinner every evening. And although most people probably don't pay much attention or understand the Latin, at least it provides a kind of pause before uh, eating. Uh, in my books, I suggest simple exercises anyone can do. And one very simple exercise of gratitude is to pause before a meal. At home, what we do is hold hands. So we have a short period when we're linked together uh, in a circle around the table, and people can give thanks in their own way. Or someone says a grace, usually me, or we sing a grace. It makes a big difference to have that beginning to a meal. And if it's done silently by holding hands, even if some people there are uh, atheists or even militant atheists, holding hands it isn't challenging anyone's belief system. It's simply providing a space for gratitude. Keeping uh, notes of a gratitude journal is another uh, very uh, good way of uh, you make daily or weekly accounts of things you're grateful for, counting your blessings. Very old-fashioned thing to do, but very effective. It's so effective that in America, where things, any new opportunity for making profit is seized on immediately, you can now buy expensive, beautifully produced gratitude journals from gift shops uh, to write your lists of gratitude, things you're grateful in. But you don't need to buy a gratitude journal. You can do it on scrap paper on your telephone or on your computer, or just make a mental note. Anyway, gratitude is... Uh, a practice that anyone can adopt very easily and it makes a big difference. What you're grateful for depends on your belief system. And this is where the difference between believers, non-believers, people who are religious, people who are spiritual but not religious, everyone can agree about the importance of gratitude. Uh, but then your belief system affects how far you go. Everyone can agree that we're grateful to the people who cook the food, who make it, who prepare it, the farmers who grow it, the people who distribute it. Um, bring it to our tables. We can be grateful to the whole earth for the, the soil, the plants, the sunlight that enables these plants to grow. So far that's uncontroversial. But then you could go further and say you feel grateful for the very source of all life itself, the source of consciousness, the, the very fact we're alive. Um, and in fact there's no limit to how far you can go until you come to the ultimate source of everything. You may want to stop short and of course there isn't time for all this before the average meal. Um, uh, um, but the belief system comes in not in ruling out gratitude or endorsing it, but in how far you go in your gratitude. Now in meditation we reach a similar situation where um, lots of people meditate. About 18 million Americans now meditate. Um, millions of people in Britain meditate. How many people here do or have meditated? <laughs> oh, well, that's most people. So the research on meditation shows that people who meditate 
have physiological benefits, lower blood pressure, all sorts of physiological benefits. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.